In Bilderberg, we have an organization that goes back to 1954. Now that original generation is mostly gone, obviously. Um, Prince Bernard of Holland was able to hang on until 1975 when he was uh, knocked out of the picture by the Lockheed scandal, which was a story of um, bribes that had been paid to foreign politicians. One thing, the reason they want to be secret is the Lockheed scandal in the 70s. They're really worried because they're doing a bunch of arms deals in there. Yeah. It was kickbacks on the Hercules C-130 transport plane that had been sold all over the world. Right now, what we see is that some of the most famous people in Bilderberg are now getting on in years, right? We have David Rockefeller, who has been financing, in particular, the North American side, but really the whole thing, with his money and his deep uh, checkbook. David Rockefeller, who many argue is one of the top globalists in the world, although aging and maybe on his last legs, has really been the face of the Rockefeller family and globalization for quite some time. In fact, in his own book, he states that he and his family are part of a secret cabal that is actually trying to achieve one world government outside of the best interests of the United States. Why should David Rockefeller, a certifiable cretin, get to dominate the political choices of the political party? Henry Kissinger is now going around in a wheelchair, as far as I can see, also quite aged. Many people are unaware of the Kissinger-Rockefeller connection. Now Kissinger, of course, is an ex-Secretary of State, a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, somebody who's been in the public eye for the better part of 40 or 50 years. Now Rockefeller meets Kissinger at the Council on Foreign Relations and is extremely impressed. So much so that he gets Kissinger to head up the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. David and Henry have maintained that relationship over several decades since. I never mentioned the, the US government or the administration. I don't even use that word. There is an invisible government whose visible head is the Council on Foreign Relations in Manhattan. And the way that they achieve their goals is they have 20 to 25 central members that go every single year to this conference. And each year, another hundred or so are recruited. You have the very cream of the banking industry and the, uh, the CEOs of various huge multinational corporations talking to uh, um, you know, elected members of parliaments from around Europe and America. This is the richest people in the world meeting with key national security NSA people, MI6, European security heads, uh, Von Rumpy of the European Central bank system and uh, the European Union Council. They're all here. They control the issuance of money and credit. This is it. Top of the pyramid. The Canadian connection is huge. Of course, former Prime Ministers. We have Pierre Trudeau and John Cretchen and Paul Martin and Stephen Harper. Harper was there in 2003. Just three years later, he becomes Prime Minister of Canada. Alan Gottlieb, former Canadian ambassador to the U.S., is also a member. We asked him about it. He denied it. In 1996, you were at uh, a Bilderberg meeting, and also there was uh, Jean Chrétien and uh, Paul Martin. I don't know if I was at that meeting. I've only been to a few of them. Bilderberg attendees have included Bill Clinton, Ben Bernanke, Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands, Senator Dianne Feinstein, Melinda Gates, Bill Gates' wife and co-founder of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, David Cameron, Rick Perry, and members of the media such as Peter Jennings and Charlie Rose. We see that there is a long line of people out there that are using their intellect to manipulate the masses with what's essentially mind control, public relations, propaganda, whatever you want to call it. Peter Manfridge of the CBC's The National is also a Bilderberg uh, member. Heather Reisman, uh, CEO of Chapters and in Indigo Books, uh, is in attendance and she obviously can exert a certain influence over the way people think uh, just by owning the amount of bookstores and magazines and newspapers. She's editor of Huffington Post Canada. Then we have former Bilderberg attendee Sean Parker eventually went on at a young age to get recruited by the CIA for a web crawler program that he built. Somewhat of an entrepreneur, Forbes 400, co-founder of Napster, uh, went on to become first president of Facebook. His newest thing is Spotify, uh, which 
as an attempt to fix what Napster broke. So this guy's kind of profiteering off of both ends and when put together with the right forces, with the right people, um, he has been known to be an agent of disruption. Why should Pamela Harriman, another certifiable cretin, the late now, uh, dominate the Democratic Party with her husband, Avril Harriman, yet another of these stupid, rich uh, oligarchs, right? The stupid sons and daughters of rich men. The Count d'Avignon, Spignu Brzezinski, um, somewhat better shape, right? Spry, but uh, also not immortal. Who is going to carry on this oligarchical tradition and in what form in the coming years? And here, I would look in particular at Peter Thiel, T-H-I-E-L, actually born in Germany, but now operating primarily in the United States. He is the co-founder of PayPal, became a billionaire through that. He is also a member of the Facebook Board of Directors, meaning that he has a fiduciary responsibility, I think, to some of the people who lost a lot of money on that abortive Facebook IPO. And he has this plan to create uh, extraterritorial offshore colonies. So I can only speculate what that means. Slavery, prostitution, narcotics, certainly no minimum wage, no health plan, uh, no child labor laws, you name it. In other words, the destruction of civilization as we've known it. You can have Hewlett Packard fire 30,000 people, as they're doing, and you can say the remnants and the scraps can be moved to Thiel's offshore islands. You bring in programmers from India. You can actually use such a place to begin to undercut the salary levels, to drag down the economy in the continental United States even further than it already is. If you control the weather, you control everything. You can control every food supply and literally every political system. So what is geoengineering? Well, it's simply the manipulation of our weather by foreign agents. Geoengineering is now defined as large-scale manipulation of the planetary environment. This is to counteract man-made climate change. This is what the Royal Society published. This is what they put out. So this is their definition, their term of geoengineering. We have this issue, which we all have to address and is of major importance to all of us, to know that people are modifying our weather. Thus, we have to look at the facts that can be proven about what's going on in the atmosphere, about what's happening, about water vapor and its impacts, about the climate and the weather modification programs that are ongoing, these are real. The public has, relatively speaking, been kept in the dark about geoengineering schemes, plans, global geoengineering governance, and the fact that right now, under research, Anyone in the world can start conducting these experiments. So we have people artificially modifying our weather in the western states. California, Pacific Gas and Electric Company, or the city of Los Angeles. It's being modified by the Texas Weather Modification Board in Texas, Colorado, Idaho, Wyoming. Lots of other states are all modifying our weather and changing our climate with extreme implications. We believe many of them are told that what they're doing is very good for the planet, perhaps saving the planet through this climate remediation. Do these operations exist? Absolutely. Just look at the USGCRP or the United States Global Change Research Program. Congress has approved it. It goes up to the presidential supplemental budget. Uh, it is absolutely known that they are funding these geoengineering operations. Our nation and many other advanced nations have been manipulating the weather for some time now. Through government white papers and even IPCC United Nations documents, we know that geoengineering is occurring. The IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, has been meeting for various years on this subject. They have produced reports uh, dating back from 1999 on aviation impacts on the global atmosphere from water vapor and other issues, um, depleting beneficial atmospheric ozone and other problems.
A group of geoengineers, a clique, essentially a small clique, has decided that the answer to our global warming problems are to release particles and chemicals into the atmosphere. David Keith, Ken Caldera, and a small group of these men affiliated with various universities have promoted this for a long time. One of the things that the geoengineering promoters, this clique, has been doing is that they have been able to keep any voices that would be in opposition to them or want to know about the impacts off the record. In other words, that they have become the experts to go to and that the public and other people have no say. They go to meetings, they go to U.S. congressional hearings, which were held on geoengineering in 2009 and 2010, three of them by the U.S. House Science and Technology Committee. They also went to hearings of the UK Parliament during the same period of time to talk about global geoengineering governance and why these experiments should go forward. One of the people promoting geoengineering is Gregory Benford. One of his papers about doing experiments in the Arctic was that they could conduct these experiments, geoengineering experiments in the Arctic, the people there could live within the experiment. And if any harm came to them, it was okay to sacrifice that, them in that area in order to conduct this research because the research was very important for them to do. The other thing he noted in an interview was that you could very easily take a little bit of aluminum and a little bit of barium and you could uh, produce these clouds and have impacts very easily in, t in the atmosphere. You've got to, in a sense, engineer all these so you get the right kind of clouds for the effects we want. It is called geoengineering, fighting global warming by putting a chemical dust in the atmosphere and reflecting harmful radiation back into space. You could use barium oxide, for example, uh, which makes big fluffy clouds. You could use tiny little bits of aluminum, which is benign in the environment, and essentially manage the climate was concerned about this attitude that it was okay to do this research and that we, all of us around the world, should be willing to live in their research experiment. And this is unacceptable. Geoengineer David Keith made uh, a statement a couple of years ago. He said geoengineering gives man godlike power. Now I've never chased godlike power. Uh, probably very few of the listeners, unless they're uh, the elite who are checking this film out. I uh, have probably have not chased godlike power, but it must be one hell of a rush. And I think what most of us can relate to is maybe a relative or a friend who became addicted to a drug. And in that drug addiction, they have put their health and their family members' health at risk in order to get the rush of that drug. What we're finding in rain tests now uh, around the world is what people are calling the chemtrail geoengineering footprint of aluminum, barium, and strontium. These metals match a number of geoengineering patents that were uh, actually designed to specifically spray these metals out of airplanes uh, into the sky for the state of gold cooling the planet. Uh, they match what geoengineers deny their spraying but state that they want to start spraying. If we take ground-based tests, for example, it does not prove the source of the pollution that we're finding in our soils, our air, and our water. It only tells us that something is happening which is not good, that aluminum is increasing, that barium is increasing in soil tests, water tests, and that associated problems are there. There is a belief or an opinion that the jets that leave these persistent jet contrails are spraying something into the atmosphere that would impact our health or cause other types of problems. I noticed when I started doing research in 2002 was that the trees in Mendocino County, Lake County, and other areas of Northern California were in extreme decline. It wasn't uh, from anything we could ascertain because it was whole suites of tree species. That means redwood trees, that means oak trees, that means manzanita, that means Douglas fir.